Welcome to one of the most exciting journeys you will ever embark upon, a journey towards understanding. Today, our destination is understanding how to interpret Shakespeare. We have two pieces of Shakespeare's text here, and I'm gonna give you some tips. I'm definitely gonna give you three tips, but I might even give you more as we uh, work through the learning, so I'm just gonna leave a blank space here for Hmm, we don't know how many tips, could be more tips, could be less. Very exciting tips for, <laughs> for, I'm going to write understanding, which is understanding is interpreting, it's analyzing, it's a lot of things, but tips for understanding Shakespeare. These are the kind of things that are designed to like uh, quickly improve your ability to understand what you're trying to read, what you're struggling with, because it ain't easy. Tip number one is, uh, this is poetry. This is poetry, it's uh, some of the best poetry that's ever been written in the English language. Uh, but poetry is written, is designed to be spoken. So if you find yourself uh, spending some time with this text and you're just looking at it and you're okay, and you're reading silently, well, you've already started running in the wrong direction. And no matter how hard you run in the wrong direction, you are running in the wrong direction. So it is meant to be spoken. And for anything that is spoken out loud or aloud, there's two really important uh, features and one feature is the speaker and the speaker who is speaking you know is a person they're a person and they have got all kinds of things going on they've got feelings uh, they are maybe reacting to something that has just happened around them they are physically located somewhere you know, I think that one of the um, real challenges that comes from reading uh, Shakespeare all by yourself, all alone, is that you see all these words and you don't realize that these words were spoken by people who were standing next to other people. Maybe when, maybe when Friar Lawrence said, that's good, my son, but where hast thou been then? Maybe he had bad breath. Maybe he had a booger hanging out of his nose while he's talking to Romeo, who is standing in front of him. And Romeo has been up all night, and Romeo is a wreck. So what does he look like? What does he smell like? Where are they located? Is the sun just rising? It's always in a physical location. Everything that's spoken. So the speaker, feeling, reacting, they're physically located somewhere. Um, they have a reason for speaking. Right? They have a reason to talk, all right? So you got your speaker, but you also have perhaps the more important part of the equation. You have your listener. So listeners, being a listener is a listener is kind of complicated because sometimes listeners aren't even paying attention. So the listener is like, are they paying attention? Are they present? And the same thing, what are they feeling? What's their relationship between, oh, this is huge. What's the relationship between these two people? Do they have a relationship? And uh, relationships can be complicated. Ha ha ha. Did they just meet? Have they known each other for 50 years? Are they old friends? Are they old enemies? Uh, what about the power between the people? Is one person like the boss and the other person is like the, um, you know, the person who has to agree with the boss, even if they have bad ideas, that kind of a thing. Um, so these are all things that are going on when words are in the air, words when words are spoken out loud. So I'm going to try to apply some of this, and we'll see if I come up with any more things that are worth writing. As we look at first sonnet 18, this is like, so this is, the sonnets were a set of poems that are all about love. And uh, 
So this is something that can stand by itself, but it's also something that's part of a much bigger set of things. So the sonnets. Uh, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. So what's the purpose here? Why is this person talking? What's, what's their reason for talking? What's the relationship between the speaker and the person with whom they are speaking? Well, this one seems to be like uh, the person speaking really likes the person that they're speaking to. And they're trying to communicate that. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So you want to speculate, well, what's the impression? So if a speaker speaks words like this, what, what's the impression that they're hoping to leave on their audience? I think I'm going to move on to the second tip. And the second tip is terminal punctuation. So when you're trying to interpret Shakespeare, you want to uh, get as much help as you can from what is available to you. And one of the things that is punctuation, one of the things that is available to you is terminal punctuation. These are things like everything matters, does a line end with one of these, 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 or one of these, and nothing. So, as we can see in the 18th sonnet here, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is, an in, this is a complete statement. So if it ends with a one of these, or one of these, it's done. This is, this is a complete idea. This is a complete idea. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So the thee is with whom I'm speaking. This is the person that I'm trying to impress, and this is me. This is the speaker. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. So now I'm, this is a complete idea. You, thou, art, you are more lovely and more temperate, nicer, okay? But now that we move into this line, we have two lines that are really a set. This should be blocked off like this. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. This comma means that whatever's following here is very closely connected. So, your, 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 your exclamation points, your question marks, and your periods, these things are idea completers, I will say. They complete, which I don't even know if completer is a word. Maybe I'll turn it into idea completion, meaning they signify the end of an idea. This right here is kind of like a, mm, I don't know. This is a, this is like a, a, a medium break. And this comma, is a light break. So this would be like if you're putting your pedal to the metal or whatever, you know, you're driving your car, you apply a medium break if you see one of these. You apply just a light break if you see a comma. And if you see nothing, 
There's no break at all. So you can see that ideas get linked together and then they're really like sets of lines are one idea and the ideas build but this gives you a little bit of hope in making so so this has like one meaning or like that's a chunk I'll call it a meaning chunk that's a fun thing to say that's a meaning chunk this is a meaning chunk. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declined by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. It tells you how to read it. Remember, this is like a light, like you're just tapping the brake. This is a medium brake. This is your tap in the brake again, and this is you stop. And so here you start again. So after these terminal punctuations, this is when you have like an idea shift. This is when things start moving, an idea shift. And you can see that very clearly by this, by this line here, starting with but. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fare thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. Even here, don't a light break, but don't stop because the poem isn't over. So this is a big chunk of meaning here. Even though it starts with but, the final but is not resolved until this line with this punctuation. So when we looked at this initially, it might have seemed impossible to understand because it's 14 lines and each line is, oh, what's going on? But really, it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, ideas. Five meaning chunks. Our terminal punctuation is there to help us. And this is even more important frequently in uh, things like dialogue between characters. Okay, so this is a standalone poem here. It's very famous. That's why I wanted you to have a chance to look at it. It's quite possibly the most famous uh, poem that is most best known in the English language, but these tips, tip number one, speaker, listener, speaker, listener, and tip, tip number two, terminal punctuation, is even more helpful as you're trying to read an entire play worth of text. For example, Friar Lawrence is the speaker, Romeo is the listener. Now, Romeo is the listener and Friar Lawrence, well, you know, they're talking to each other. And they're in, located in a physical space. They are human beings having a conversation. So that helps you understand because when Romeo speaks here, it's not like he's responding to this specific question. But where hast thou been then? And then he answers. And then Friar Lawrence responds to his answer. And he didn't like his answer. He said, be plain good son. But then here's a little clue. Were they strangers? Did they, were they, they never met each other before? He just called him good son. So that's a little clue to their relationship. So you're always building clues to the relationships through the things that are said, the way that they are said. Um, so you build clues as you move through the text. So I don't know. I'll just put it here. You're building understanding through clues. And you have to find the clues. You are a detective, and you're trying to notice everything. So there's the relationship applied to this piece of text. 
Now, what about the terminal punctuation? Oh, it's even more important. It's so important because without your understanding of terminal punctuation, this dialogue between these two characters makes no sense. Like if you read it like, that's my good son, but where hast thou been then? Our terminal punctuation. If there's nothing, don't stop. If there's nothing, no stop. So if we read a little deeper, Romeo says, I'll tell thee, ere thou ask me again. Terminal punctuation, stop. Take a breath. I'll tell thee, ere thou ask it me again. Here is one chunk of meaning because the terminal punctuation isn't until the end. I have been feasting with mine enemy, where on a sudden one hath wounded me. That's by me wounded. Both are remedies within thy help and holy physic lies. I bear no hatred, blessed man, for, lo, my intercession likewise steads my foe. In this case, your pronouns are confusing. They're clear, but they're confusing. Does that make sense? <laughs> Nothing in Shakespeare is by accident. So if you don't understand something, I always like to say this, it's, it's your job to figure it out. Because we've decided as humanity that Shakespeare is pretty good. Um, so you need to search for your clarity. And so I have been feasting with mine enemy, where on a sudden one, one is like someone, like a person. But who is the person? So pronouns, I guess I'll, I'll do my third tip right now, which as you can guess is understand pronouns. It is figure out pronouns. And so pronouns, N-O-U-N-S, pronouns are nouns that stand for other nouns. So they are he, she, it, that one, someone, some. Uh, the word this. So these are all these little words that you might ch trip over or think that they're not important. They all refer, they always, whenever you hear the word he, it means like someone specific. And so you have to figure those out. So for example, going back to the sonnet number 18, but thy eternal son, so this is thy. So here's a pronoun, thy. I'm gonna add it because in Shakespeare, we have old pronouns that aren't used anymore. Thy, which means your, thou, which means you. But thy eternal sum, summer shall not fade. So this is, I'm telling you, but your, you, I'm talking to you. But your eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou. So there's you again, you owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. Who's his shade? Well, death. This refers back to death. Death is male, and death is dark, so death has shade, so, which means you'll never die. <laughs> Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou, so here's you again, in eternal lines to time, and this line right here is the key to the poem, you growest, you, you get bigger eternally, without stop, you just keep getting bigger and meaning more. So long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this. And here is the key pronoun. This is always my question when I'm trying to see if someone understands this poem. That word this is a pronoun, and this always refers to things that are specific. So what is this? 
And uh, you can put the answer right here. You can put it in the comments. <laughs> what is this? Because this pronoun, if you don't understand what this pronoun is, this poem doesn't make any sense to you. Same thing is true for this line right here. But I have been feasting with mine enemy whereon a sudden one hath wounded me. Who is this one? Who wounded? Who wounded Romeo? Juliet wounded Romeo. Even though, so she's from the family of the enemy. So you would think the enemy would wound, but the way that he was wounded was not the way that you would expect the enemy to wound. And so that's what Shakespeare does. That's where on a sudden one hath wounded me, that by me wounded. Both are remedies within thy help. Who is he talking to? Thy means your. So he's talking your help. I need your help, Friar Lawrence, and holy physic lies. I bear no hatred, blessed man, for lo, my intercession likewise steads for my foe. <laughs> Be plain, good son, and homely in thy drift. Riddling confession brings riddling shrift, which means shrift is what you get if you are absolved of your sins. Well, if you want to be absolved of your sins, you should be very clear in what you did wrong and not talk in riddles. Then plainly, but again, here, terminal punctuation. There is none, which means there's no break here. The, then plainly know my heart's dear love is set on the fair daughter of rich Capulet. As mine on hers, so hers is set on mine, and all combined, save what thou must combine by holy. <laughs> See, you would think sometimes, like, because this rhymes, that you'd stop here. As mine on hers, so hers is set on mine, and all combined, save what thou must combine. Save what thou must combine by holy marriage. When and where and how we met. We wooed and made exchange of vow. I'll tell thee as we pass, but this I pray that thou consent to marry us today. These are your three tips. I thought I'd do more, but this is plenty. Three tips for understanding. Number one, spoken. Who is speaking? Who is being spoken to? Number two, terminal punctuation. How does each line end? Is it connected to the next line, or is it a complete idea in itself with a terminal punctuation? And finally, figure out the pronouns. Never will you see a he, or a she, or an it, or a one, or a someone, or a some, or a this, or a thy, or a thou that is not referring directly to someone specific. And that's the end of this learning. Have a wonderful day.